I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINNetwork.com. Welcome to RAIN's Essential Geopolitics Podcast. My name is Emma Kami, and I will be your host today as we discuss the global economy. Here with me today is Marcus Yeager, a global e economy analyst at RAIN. Welcome, Marcus. Hello, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, so to start us off, uh, what is the outlook for the global economy in terms of growth uh, and inflation? So the outlook, broadly speaking, is, is one of elevated inflation. I think we are past uh, the inflationary peak, but inflation will probably remain high throughout 2023 uh, and 2024. Um, had you asked me this question like three weeks ago, I would have said that we're in for significant monetary t continued monetary tightening uh, throughout 2023. Um, I think that's now slightly less likely, but I'll say a few words about this uh, later on. We'll probably see some tightening, but not as much as we would have expected just a few weeks ago. Uh, and certainly what we will be seeing is slow economic growth, in particular in the advanced economies. So that's the United States uh, and Europe in, in particular. For the emerging markets, the outlook is a little more mixed. We'll have some regions that uh, will see a further decline in economic growth, uh, notably the Middle East and Latin America. Uh, Asia will probably be uh, doing slightly better because of China's reopening. Uh, and Africa will also be doing more or less uh, as well as it did did last um, uh, last year. But let me say a few words about how how this uh, how how we got to where we are right now. So I think the way to think about the outlook is to acknowledge that we've seen a a massive increase in demand coming out of the COVID pandemic. So we saw significant fiscal stimulus administered by governments. We saw a huge accumulation of household savings, which gave households a lot of purchasing power after the, the pandemic. We also saw, at least initially, supply chain disruptions. And what we certainly have seen, and this surprised a lot of economists, is very tight labor markets, which are continued to this day. So just to give you, give you sort of an anecdotal data point here, US labor markets are at their tightest in more than 50 years. That is quite, uh, quite impressive and accounts to a significant extent for continued high inflation. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the details, but the key going forward in terms of fighting inflation is to basically weaken labor markets in, in Europe and the United States. And, and in both regions, we have very low unemployment and continued wage pressures, which is largely expressed uh, in, in terms of higher services inflation. What we have seen is some disinflation when it comes to uh, the price to, to goods. So that's that points in the right direction. But but really broadly speaking, um, where we are at right now is headline inflation has peaked and is declining in part because of lower energy and commodity prices. But the but core inflation continues to be high and is even sort of slightly edging up. Now, it's very difficult to say where exactly this will lead over the next couple of months. But broadly speaking, going forward, we would expect inflation to uh, also core inflation to stabilize and then decline uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because both the uh, European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve have significantly increased interest rates over the past nine to 12 months. So just to give you a sense, the ECB policy rate is now at 3%. It used to be at minus 0.5% less than a year ago. And uh, just actually, just 10 minutes ago, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates by another 25 basis points. So here we've moved from virtually zero to like uh, 4.75 to 5% right now. So a really significant monetary tightening over the past uh, nine to 12 months in, in the world's two largest uh, economy economies. Um, importantly, also, if you don't want to take my word for it, a, a survey of, of professional economists uh, has shown that, uh, that a significant uh, number of them expect a recession. Um, and I think that was a survey that was taken even before the financial crisis. So I think the, the, the financial instability we've seen, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about this later on, uh, 
the financial stability, instability that we have seen will probably further weigh on, on, on economic growth. So um, just to sort of uh, summarize this, uh, we are looking for continued high inflation in 2023 and 2024. We'll probably see a further increase in, in interest rates, but not massively so. And we will see a further decline in economic growth in Europe and in the US. Um, the, the, as I said, the Fed just also released its summary of economic projections and now sees economic growth at 0.4% for this year. So this is very, very low growth. And uh, the key question is, will a recession be avoided? To some extent, as you know, that's an academic question. What really matters is that we will see a continued decline in economic weakness in, in both the euro area and the United States in 2023. Key, key risk to this forecast is, of course, the further evolution of the financial and banking crises that we've sort of seen pop up in the United States and in Europe. Um, but I'm sure we'll get to talk about this later on, just to highlight that this is a, is a major uh, risk factor that creates some uncertainty around this forecast. That makes sense. Um, and what explains the recent financial volatility um, and how will it likely impact the outlook over the next few quarters? So there's a couple of ways to look at this. From a very macro level, in a sense, we should not be surprised. In fact, uh, we, we have been looking for financial vulnerabilities and financial crises. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we are really coming out of a prolonged period of very low interest rates. As you probably remember, in 2008-9, the world's major, major central banks cut rates to like zero or even below zero. And we've been in a, other than between 15 and 17, we've basically been in, a, in, a, in an environment where, where money was, um, uh, you didn't have to pay anything for money. So that the cost of capital was in, 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 some, in some sense really zero. When you have this, what typically happens is that investors chase returns and they're increasingly willing to, to take on risk. And so on a risk adjusted basis, they, they start making mistakes. So as I said, we've been looking for financial vulnerabilities for the past 12 months since, since the ECB and the Fed started hiking rates. Uh, we've seen some, some of this uh, in the developing economies. We've seen financial volatility and financial and sovereign defaults. We've seen wobble, uh, wobbles in the UK guild market a few months ago. Of course, one of the large crypto uh, firms has gone belly up. Uh, and more recently, we've also seen, uh, which is much more concerning in my view, we've seen increasing instability and fragility in the US banking sector, and at least among one major systemically important financial institutions in Europe, notably Credit Suisse. So this is the macro backdrop. Investors do make mistakes. And in many ways, what we're seeing today, and I'm somewhat surprised that journalists don't point this out uh, enough, is a sort of a rerun of the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s and early 1990s in the United States. A very similar scenario where in the late 1970s, the Fed really increased interest rates very sharply, which led to significant losses on, of uh, um, asset values in, in banks and higher funding costs, and that pushed a lot of them into insolvency. So not, not, not quite unlike um, what we've seen more recently with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. So what's happened here is that these banks, in a sense, also took on too much risk or the wrong kind of risk by going further out the yield curve, locking in long-term interest rates, and then they saw their short-term funding costs go up, and to some extent, they were forced into a liquidity-driven bankruptcy by a lot of a lot of depositors pulling out their money, um, so so this is then has a lot of investors to like look at many many other banks in the United States and and they were wondering what banks have a similar balance sheet, which then also might get into trouble, um, and they found some and we've seen some continued volatility, but at the same time uh, we've seen also relatively forceful government intervention. The government stepped in to take over these two banks. Uh, it's actually already sold one of those or large, large parts of the bank. And very importantly, they've guaranteed even the uninsured deposits in both of these banks in order to prevent broader deposit flight from small and mid-sized banks to larger banks. A second important point here is that the larger US banks, which account for about two thirds of, of US banking assets, they by all accounts seem to be in, in a fairly strong uh, in, in, a, in a fairly fairly strong shape. In fact, they're the ones benefiting from a lot of the deposit outflows. So this is very, very different as far as, as one can tell at this point from like 2008. 
when uh, the larger systemically important banks in the United States came a lot of pressure. This time, this is really a crisis that affects mid-sized banks, and at this stage, at least to a far lesser extent, smaller banks. So I think this makes the uh, the task the authorities face uh, easy, well, not easy, but easier than, than 15 years ago. They have now a means to intervene. Uh, they know they can't really let the bank fail. And so that's what they've been doing. They've, they've been trying to intervene relatively preemptively to take over the banks and to prevent a further crisis and also create some kind of backstop for the, uh, for the banking system. Um, let me just say one, one thing about why this is relevant in terms of the economic outlook. If that fragility continues, um, my money is on, I think we're probably getting through this okay, but this is very difficult to say at this stage in a crisis. But the longer this continues, the more we will probably see some sort of credit crunch, meaning a, a decline in credit provision to the economy, particularly as far as the mid-sized and the smaller banks are concerned, which are really the banks that are under financial pressure right now. And that then could have a significant economic impact in terms of no, you have no credit, you have lower, lower investment, you already have investors on edge who will be less likely to invest, including real economy investors. So the longer this, this uh, crisis and this instability and this uncertainty continues, the more we will see an impact on the economy and the more likely we will get to a recession scenario as opposed to a slowdown scenario in the United States. Interestingly, in Europe, things have been relatively stable, with the exception of Credit Suisse, but that seems to have been sorted out um, last weekend. So for now, all eyes are, are on, uh, on the US in terms of where this goes. And I would argue that because of this, if, if things continue the, the, the way uh, things are right now, the US is a slightly greater risk of suffering economic damage from this crisis than the Europeans at this stage. But as I said, when you're in the midst of a crisis, it's very, very difficult to make to make very, uh, very confident forecasts. So, but for now, I, I think the U.S. economy would suffer slightly more than the European economy. Wow. Okay. And how does all of this impact emerging and developing markets? Um, and where do we want to stand in terms of financial risks? Um, so, what I would say here is, um, so again, taking taking the macro view here. What's been happening over the past 12 months is generally always bad news for emerging markets. Um, I hope you forgive me to bring in some economics here. So a strong dollar is typically bad for, for, for emerging and developing economies. Why? Because they usually carry a significant amount of dollar debt. So as the dollar strengthens, the debt burden increases. We've also seen, as I mentioned, increasing interest rates, which also adds to the debt burden in these countries. And interestingly, in this, in this cycle, we've seen a stronger dollar and stronger commodity prices. Now, you might think that stronger commodity prices somewhat, somewhat offset a stronger dollar, and that's true, at least for those countries that, uh, that are net commodity exporters. But depending on what kind of commodity you export, uh, you might also be badly affected by it. So, for example, if you are an emerging or developing economy that, requires, uh, that relies a lot on food imports, you were in for a bad surprise after the beginning of um, the, the Ukraine invasion last year. So this has also added to, to the problems of many emerging markets, and particularly developing economies. So again, and then lastly, I would say that the uh, economic slowdown that we're expecting in the advanced economies in, in the US and in Europe in particular, will also weigh on the economic outlook because these two countries represent a large chunk of the global economy and uh, their, their slowdown will also impact economic growth to some extent and to different degrees in, in the emerging market and developing economy space. So generally what we've seen over the past 12 months is, is, is bad news. Now, of course, there are different types of emerging market economies, but that's sort of broadly, broadly this is a negative impact that brings a negative impact. Um, I think the way to look at this more broadly, though, and this is really broad brush, so forgive me, what we think of as middle income economies, so think of the Brazils and Mexicos and Indias of this world, they are the ones who, um, this is not a very friendly scenario for them, but unlike 15, 20 years ago, when in this scenario they would experience significant financial difficulties, I think they will get through this okay for a number of reasons. They have larger foreign exchange reserves, they tend to have more flexible exchange rates, 
They tend to, tend to have more credible central banks that help keep inflation low. And broadly speaking, they have lower net foreign currency debt. So this is why I'm relatively confident that with a couple of exceptions, these countries will get through this without suffering a major financial calamity. The, the countries that I'm much more worried about is, is low-income countries or really lower-middle-income countries. And we've already seen a couple of accidents here, so just run you through a list. Sri Lanka defaulted, Zambia defaulted, Ghana is, is, uh, is basically in default, Lebanon is in default, and Pakistan and Egypt are teetering on the edge of a default. And we'll see where, where this goes. And so you see these are countries that, um, if they're not necessarily low-income countries, they're certainly second-tier, middle-income countries. So they're not your, your China or your Brazil or even your Russia, if you will. Russia, of course, in default as well, but that's a politically driven default. So um, to make a, a long story short, there's a, there's a bunch of countries that uh, face a difficult, uh, difficult prospects. I think most of these countries face deteriorating economic conditions, but only some of them will be financially vulnerable to the, um, to the ongoing trend in, in the global economy, in particular in advanced economies, which is lower growth, slightly higher interest rates, and uh, also strong, a stronger euro and a stronger dollar, which will not help them from, a, from an economic and financial um, perspective. So to round this up, I would just say, um, and this is largely based on IMF, IMF forecasts that are now a couple of months old, but I think broadly that's, that we're, we're still, that's still correct. We will see a, a fairly tangible slowdown in Latin America, particularly in Brazil and Mexico. We will also see a slowdown in, in the Middle East, and by Middle East I'm mostly referring to oil producers. They will come off from a fairly significant level of, of high growth in, in 2022, because of lower oil prices, but still do relatively okay. We will see, in aggregate, a stronger growth in, in Asia, um, but that's largely owed to China's reopening, and we'll see more or less unchanged growth in, in Africa. So at the very, very high level, the different regions uh, face different, different prospects. But the key thing, really, from a risk management perspective, it seems to me, is to figure out which of particular developing countries is most at risk of, of uh, suffering either financial crises or prolonged economic malaise against the backdrop of this um, broadly deteriorating global economic and financial environment. Wow. Um, thank you for that analysis, Marcus. You can stay up to date on geopolitical events and their effects on your business with RAIN Intelligence Briefs. Our flagship risk intelligence products provide clients with access to the insights and analyses they need to make more informed decisions and drive better risk management outcomes, all for a fraction of the cost you pay yourself. Sign up at RainNetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E Network.com. I'm Emma Kami. Thanks for listening.